I'm Andrew Schwartz, and you're listening to The Truth of the Matter, a podcast by CSIS where we break down the top policy issues of the day and talk with the people that can help us best understand what's really going on. This is a really special episode of The Truth of the Matter because we have a dear friend of me and of CSIS, Mariana Comparo. Mariana was the CEO of COMEXI, which is the Mexican Council on Foreign Relations. She's a senior associate at CSIS. And maybe most importantly, she's the host of the terrific podcast, Mexico Matters, which if you want to hear a great podcast about U.S.-Mexican relations and about really why Mexico matters, listen to Mariana. It's one of the very best podcasts we have here at CSIS. Mariana, welcome. So great to have you. Well, Andrew, on the contrary, coming from you, you know, sort of my teacher, my mentor on this podcasting world, it's really, really incredible to hear that. So thank you so much. I am very, very happy to be on your show today. So cool to have you with us. So right now, what we should talk about, we've got a lot to talk about when it comes to Mexico, but maybe the biggest headline is the upcoming presidential election. And I wanted to ask you, why is it so important and who are the candidates? Perfect. So let me start with the first part of your question. Why is this so important? Two things, the positive and the negative. Okay. I'll start with the positive. If everything remains the same, you know, as economists will say, in the next presidential election, Mexico will make history by electing its first woman president. The irony of that is that that would be sooner than the United States, Canada, Spain, but much later, however, than other countries in Latin America, which is interesting. You know, sort of we have seen women presidents in Chile, in Nicaragua, in Brazil, in Argentina. So in this case in particular, Latin America and not North America is leading the way. And as of right now, Andrew, there is not only one, but two women candidates leading the race in Mexico. It is not the first time that Mexico has had two women on the ballot, but what it is different this time is that the leading party, Morena, which is the party of President López Obrador, as well as a coalition of three opposition parties, have chosen women to represent them in the next election. Moreover, I would say that both women Claudia Sheinbaum and Xochitl Galvez are pretty good candidates in their own right. The first, Claudia, is López Obrador's de facto appointee. She was, until very recently, the former mayor of Mexico City, which is the second most important political job in the country. Although we're still months away, right? And uh, in politics, nine months is really a lifetime. If the elections were held today, Claudia will win by more than 10 points. But considering, and I think this is important, considering that Claudia has been in the limelight for the past five years as mayor of Mexico City, and also the fact that the president has actively campaigned in her favor, that public resources have been used to position her at a national level, I think it says something about Xochitl that, you know, she's an opposition candidate that literally just emerged from a movement that was led by civil society to become the candidate of the opposition. And she was really not well known until very recently. So what appeared like an election with no opposition only two months ago can now become a very competitive race. All of this sounds really, really incredible. But I think that the reason why this election is also super important is because what is at stake. And this election, depending on who will win and by how much, I believe it will determine what kind of country will Mexico become in the future. And it is very likely that because of its importance, that this succession process will be very complicated and even possibly marked by violence. Mariana, this is fascinating. You've got two very prominent women running for president in Mexico. And out of nowhere, as you said, seemingly, 
comes Mrs. Galvez. So tell us, what are the differences between the two candidates? When Americans are looking south and thinking about who the next president of Mexico is going to be, what are some of the key differences between these two candidates? I think both of them, Claudia and Xochitl, are both in their 60s, which is important only because they're from a completely different political generation than the president. They have both been in politics for about 20 years, but their personal stories and their policies, they're really, really different. Let me start with Claudia Sheinbaum. As her name indicates, she was born to a Jewish-Hungarian middle-class family that immigrated to Mexico. She studied physics. She comes from academia, but also has ample experience in politics. As we said, she has been the manager of the biggest city in the country, and she has shown discipline, tremendous political ability, and more importantly, Andrew, loyalty. She's trusted by AMLO, and she chose her. She trusts that she will continue with his policies, and maybe more importantly, that she will protect him and his family from potential prosecution. Ah, okay. So now now we're starting to understand a little bit about AMLO's motivations. Yeah. She's also very competent. I don't want to remove that from her. She ran the biggest city in Mexico and, you know, I suppose did it pretty smoothly. She did it very smoothly. And although she has been very careful not to openly disagree with AMLO, with a lot of his policies, just by how she managed the city, I think you can tell some differences. You know, for example, she has been very respectful of experts in her own cabinet, although it was filled also with a lot of loyalists. She also had people with great credentials. She managed the pandemic better. She has managed security better. And she's a scientist. So that will probably be the most important difference, I think, between her and AMLO, who has really been guided by ideology. And on the other hand, you have Xochitl Galvez, right? As her name indicates, she comes from an indigenous background. Her story is truly, truly inspirational. I mean, she grew up in dirt poverty. She sold gelatines on the streets of Mexico to pay for her college tuition. She got a computer engineering degree from one of Mexico's top public universities, and she started her own business after that. But, you know, she also has experience in politics. She was in the cabinet of President Fox, and she has managed one of the Mexico City's municipalities, and she's now in the Senate. So she's also an experienced politician. Personality-wise, she's open, she's fun, she wears these beautiful traditional shirts, She rides her bicycle to work. You know, she understands business, free market economics. She's open to the world. And because of her own story of hard work, she appeals to the middle classes. But also because of her background, she appeals to, you know, the poorer sectors of the country. I think that one of her biggest challenges is that because of, you know, her style, you know, she uses bad words and she's pro-abortion openly. That, you know, that might not play as well with the more conservative sectors of the country. Well, they sound like two absolutely fascinating and actually pretty cool candidates when you think about it. Yeah, absolutely. They're very competent. So does this increase representation of women in Mexican government as candidates as well, an indication of a greater cultural shift that's going on in Mexico? Yes, I truly think there is a cultural shift in Mexico. Just let me give you my example, right? As a Mexican who attended university in Mexico, when women were clearly, clearly the minority, to see one of the most powerful presidents in Mexican history choose a woman to be his successor, I mean, that is just historical. But in addition to the presidency, if we get a woman, there is something happening in Mexico. For example, we have a woman who is the president of the Supreme Court. A woman is head of the central bank. A woman is head of the national electoral institution. A woman is now secretary of the state. Half of Congress is now female. Seven out of the 32 governorships are also women. You know, of course, this is due to some cultural changes, but also I think it's partly due because of federally mandated gender equality laws. 
But, you know, I think that although this is really, really positive, I think that having said that, I think it's also important to say that a lot of things haven't changed. And I think probably the saddest one is the fact that Mexico is still known for its macho culture. And we're still one of the countries that have the most femicides a year. You know, 10 women and 10 women and girls are killed every day in Mexico, every day, just because they are women. So going back to the elections, there's been a feminist movement growing in Mexico in the past few years. They might play a significant role in this election. And in that sense, Claudia doesn't appeal to them because she has not been supportive with the thousands of women that have marched on the streets just demanding justice for their loved ones. So this might also play in politics. You know, how has the Mexican public received all of this? And, you know, having two women with very different backgrounds and against the backdrop of a macho culture that remains the tragedy of femicide, how is the Mexican public reacting to having two candidates such as these? On the one hand, you know, I think you have half of the population like me that, you know, we're really, really excited about, you know, sort of it doesn't matter who wins, right? It'll be a woman. But there are a lot of men that are not openly embracing this because that macho society is still against sort of the empowerment of Mexico. So I think it'll be interesting if we really arrive at the election with only two women candidates. Will men come out to vote in the same numbers? We will just have to see what happens. So does Socio actually have a chance of winning? (laughs) That's a very good question. And as pretty as everything uh, we just talked about sounds, the truth of the matter, actually, is that this election will not be an election between two women, Sochil and Claudia. This election will actually be an election between one woman, Sochil, and President López Obrador, who, although he will not be in the ballot, he's working tirelessly using his daily bully pulpit as well as the whole machinery of the state with all of their resources to elect his candidate, Claudia, in the next election. This is really not a level playing field. And Xochitl is being attacked on a daily basis by, you know, either the president or members of his own party. They're coming up with stories to try to discredit her. And moreover, You know, there are 23 out of the 32 states governed that are governed by Morena. So you will also have 23 governors using public resources to campaign in favor of Claudia. You ask me if Xochitl has a chance. Honestly, despite everything that I just told you, I do think she has a chance. But let me explain to you what I think will need to happen for that to occur. I think three things. One is very important that the opposition really stays with only one candidate, united against Sochi. If the opposition were to break and there is another third party candidate that emerges, then AMLO whose base is around 25 or 30 percent, will be enough for the Morena party to win this election, especially because in Mexico we don't have a second round. So the vote will be divided among three. Another important factor is the middle classes. Ample sectors of Mexico's middle classes voted for López Obrador back in 2018, and he has not been very good with the middle classes. So, you know, it's a question mark. Who will they go for? And the third one, it's voter participation. We talked a little bit, right, sort of about whether the men will come out to vote or not. But in the past election, AMLO's election in 2018, Mexico had a 63 participation rate, which is really high. But if we break that number, 15% lower participation from let's say Mexico City to the north, then from Mexico City to the south. And from Mexico City to the north is where the rich states are, the states that actually depend on an export economy and depend on the United States. 
the southern part of Mexico is poorer, less well connected, and people mostly depend on government handouts. So how many of the people from the north will come out to vote is really the question. So what are some of the risks you think between now and the actual election for Mexico with the uncertainty that Mexico might experience? Oof, what worries me the most is that from now until not the next election, June, but from now until the next president is inaugurated, more or less a year from now, that we might see not only volatility, but probably violence as well. And when I say violence, I mean violence initiated either by the government or the Morena party, who I believe will fight dirty to retain power at any cost or even by organized crime, who, as we have seen, they have been willing to use any means to protect their turf. And this administration has really allowed them to grow and to prosper at unprecedented levels, even by just not persecuting them. I don't know if you remember, but during the past 2021 midterm elections, they were really characterized by heightened levels of violence aimed at various political actors, including government officials, candidates, party workers. But, you know, the fact was that the narcos really succeeded in electing their preferred candidates in many local elections. And experts say that they managed to create a corridor that goes along the Mexican Pacific all the way up to the U.S. border. They will come out to vote again in this election. Another risk, I think, is that if the elections are too close or if Claudia loses, that AMLO will refuse to accept the results. I mean, sounds familiar, right? Well, that's a lot to think about. Mariana, how would you view each candidate's agenda in terms of U.S.-Mexican relations, both geopolitically and economically? Let's assume for a second that Claudia wins. And here the question becomes by how much. If we have a competitive election, even if Claudia wins, then it will not be possible for the Morena party to get a qualified majority in Congress and thus much harder to make the reforms or the policies of the AMLO administration permanent. It would be even hard for them to pass a budget. In Mexico, you need two-thirds to change the Constitution. So if Claudia wins by a landslide, then AMLO's policies could become permanent. And that would not be good for Mexico, nor for the United States. You know, think, let's think about energy, about nearshoring corn, security, the military, you know, and forget about the backlash on democracy. It really doesn't sound very good. Claudia, in terms of politics, she has similar views than AMLO. You know, she comes from a family of uh, leftist circles who have always been against U.S. imperialist powers and more in favor to Cuba. You know, sort of that is sort of a difference in Mexico. And Claudia herself ha has helped create the main uh, leftist opposition party in Mexico. In terms of energy, for example, which, you know, we really care about, uh, she rejects market policies and she's a firm believer to continue to give priority to Pemex and the CFE, which is the electricity company. But she's also an environmentalist and uh, she believes in green energy. So the question to me is how will she manage those two? Xochitl, on the other hand, although she is the candidate of three very different political parties, she's really an independent. She's a centrist and she's open-minded, more globalized, pro-business, pro-market. In terms of foreign policy, for example, let me give you an example. She has openly opposed uh, being friends to the other dictators in Latin America, like in Venezuela, Cuba, or Nicaragua. And she's actually come out in favor of Maria Corina Machado, the opposition candidate in Venezuela. She's also openly in favor of renewables. She has said that she will take a market position vis-a-vis -vis Pemex and the CFE. 
So she's really not nationalistic or ideological, which, you know, will play much better in terms of looking, looking north and uniting Mexico more to North America. So this brings me to maybe, you know, this is the critical issue that you talk about in your podcast, Mexico Matters, all the time. You know, Americans typically think about crime and immigration when they think about Mexico, yet there's so much more we should be thinking about. And your podcast really examines that. Can you talk about some of the things that you explore on the podcast and tell us why Americans, you know, should be more acutely aware of these issues? It is certainly true that we typically hear and tell, you know, I'm also guilty about the stories that Latin America is filled with corruption and violence and migration. But I think that there are two main tectonic plates that are occurring in the region and that really have the potential to transform not only Mexico, but also the rest of Latin America. And one of them is nearshoring, which I think is more talked about. So if you want, let me just focus on an, on the other trend that I don't think it really has caught the attention of many in Washington. And it is the story of the Latin American technology and entrepreneurial ecosystem. It has certainly caught the eye of many global businesses and international investors. Let me give you an example. In 2021 alone, $50 billion of venture capital was invested in the region. That year, there were 45 unicorns that emerged in Latin America. And, you know, sort of those are the unicorns, but there are hundreds, hundreds of other startups that are really driving innovation. They're disrupting economies, not only by competing against the big incumbent companies, but they're also eliminating the intermediaries. They're empowering small businesses. They're really sort of helping people, you know, maybe the cliche, right? Banking the unbanked, insuring the uninsured, even if it sounds cliche. But it's true that, you know, sort of thanks to these companies and also to electronic payments, more and more transactions are being conducted electronically instead of by cash. And so, you know, you have economies that were mainly informal economies that are moving into the formal economies. And that also allows people to create, you know, credit profiles to get access to credit. And these companies are offering products to, you know, millions of people that had never even been looked at, right? Sort of they're offering better and cheaper products. And uh, that is really transforming the, the Latin American economies. If one thing I think it would be important is for Washington to take a look at what is happening in here and maybe push some of the governments to protect this ecosystem by, you know, sort of not allowing the big traditional Latin American companies crush this younger newcomers, but just by just allowing them to compete on a level playing field. I think that would be a lot. And Mariana, next week at CSIS, there's going to be a really terrific event that you put together. Can you tell our listeners about it? Because I know they're going to want to either come in person or tune in. Absolutely. I'll be very happy. Well, we have as a speaker's the leaders of General Atlantic, which is one of the biggest investors in the region and most successful. We also have someone from Chubb Insurance who will talk about how global businesses are partnering with these young entrepreneurs. And more importantly, we have three incredible CEOs David Vélez, who is the CEO of Nubank, which is the largest, really the world's largest digital bank. We have Adolfo Babat from Clip, which is a payment company. And we have Carlos Otati, which is CAVAC, which is they have empowered the middle classes by allowing them to have car ownership. So I hope, I really hope that a lot of people can come and see them in person because it's not going to be a live event or later that, you know, they will look at the recording. Right. So let's make that clear. You can't watch it live. You can watch it on demand later. But if you want to see it live, 
come to CSIS next Wednesday, September 27th at 9 a.m. Um, there's information on our website about the event. It's called The Future of Latin America's Entrepreneurial Ecosystem. And Mariana, I can't wait to see you in person. Me too. See you Wednesday. Yes, absolutely. And thank you so much for this and helping us understand and get to the truth of the matter about what's going on um, with this Mexican election. And I know my listeners will all be listening to Mexico Matters as well. Well, I cannot thank you enough, Andrew. Seriously, thank you so much for having me on your show. If you enjoyed this podcast, check out our larger suite of CSIS podcasts from Into Africa, The Asia Chessboard, China Power, AIDS 2020, The Trade Guys, Smart Women, Smart Power, and more. You can listen to them all on major streaming platforms like iTunes and Spotify. Visit csis.org slash podcasts to see our full catalog 